Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm going to give everybody just a few minutes to get themselves situated and be ready and uh, get yourselves comfortable for the next half hour of your time, of which I can't thank you enough. So you may hear me fidgeting in the background a little bit, but again, I am just giving everybody time to be able to give, give everybody an opportunity to log in and start watching our illustrious presentation. So bear with us here. We'll get going in just a minute. All right, everybody, let's uh, give everybody a few minutes to get settled in here. So why don't we go ahead and uh, kick this off? First and foremost, I want to thank everybody that's tuning in for coming to the inaugural uh, broadcast, live broadcast of Estate Management Solutions. This has been under development for a little bit now. I've been trying to figure out a way to bring some basic uh, curriculum to the private service professional where you're not having to travel or spend an absorbent amount of money to get uh, at least uh, some basic insight into our industry. I also wanted to give those out there who have not been in our industry uh, or looking to get into the industry some insight about what it truly takes to work in our industry basically take away the glamour, take away the glitz, and this is the realities of our job, uh, a job that I absolutely cherish and adore uh, and am driven to by a passion. Uh, a couple of things before we get kicked off here, I wanted to let you know, there is about a 20 to 30 second delay in from the time I speak to when you actually hear. So if you have any questions about the content, uh, please bear with me if I if it does seem like I take a few minutes to get to it. Just because I'm waiting for a breaking point, I will get to the questions as, uh, as they're asked. Possibly, if we have to, I'll, I'll get to them after the end, and maybe even as comments in the, uh, in the Facebook Live post when the video gets posted on, uh, on Estate Management Solutions Facebook page. I do encourage you to offer your insights and ask any questions. Uh, if you are a seasoned professional, there is no better uh, act than helping someone out or giving someone clarity uh, it, based on your experiences. I could sit up here and talk all day long. I promise I won't. But it doesn't hold substance unless really people hear a united voice about these difficulties and these obstacles. With all that being said, let's go ahead and uh, get going here. I wanted to first talk about what I consider are the four key consistencies. Now, I do call them consistencies, and I picked that word with a very specific reason. It is, we have to embody these personal traits constantly and consistently don't we can't falter these we are responsible for hundreds thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars at times and the only way that we can trust what uh, or that way our principals can trust us is if these four consistencies are consistent 
First one, of course, as always, is honesty. Now let's take a look at honesty from its definition. And there's a few point words that stick out in these definitions. Honesty refers to the fact, fa I'm sorry, honesty refers to the facet of moral character and denotes positive, virtuous attributes such as integrity, truthfulness, and straightforwardness. It embodies truthfulness, sincerity, and frankness. Now, the two words that really speak to me here are frankness and straightforwardness. A lot of the times we get intimidated by our principles because they are of what we perceive as a higher status in life. Now, yes, they have worked harder. There is that intimidation there. But if we are being honest, we're not doing anything wrong. We are just clearly communicating with them. And honesty is necessary. And honesty, not only with them, but also with yourself. In the beginning stages of your job, you got to be honest with yourself in the sense of, is this the right job for me? Am I the right person for this job? Am I interested in this job or am I taking this job simply because I am panicking and I need an income? Well, that's not the right reason to take a job. So be honest with yourself. I had this come up many years ago when I was interviewing for a position and I had to be honest with myself. I wanted the job. I needed the job, but I knew the job wasn't the right fit for me because part of the interviewing process, it came to light that we actually would have to buy all the Christmas gifts, birthday gifts, and all of the you know gifts for the children of the family. Now, we all live how we want to, uh, we all live how we want to, and I'm not here to judge anyone. However, I will say that I personally draw issue with having to buy your kid's birthday presents. If you don't, take the job. I do. So therefore, I was being honest with myself and saying that I couldn't take this job. The reason, the core reason is that if you're dishonest with yourself, you'll be okay for the first six months. You'll be okay for the first, maybe even longer, first 12 months of the job. But after a while, you are going to get absolutely sick and tired of doing everything for the kids. And you're going to start to see the behaviors that stem from such actions and you're going to get frustrated. So again, be honest with yourself as to what kind of job that you want. Be honest with your employer. If this is too much work for you, if you need a break, you need to talk to them about it. Next uh, consistency is respect. And respect is a due regard for feeling, wishes, rights, and traditions of others. Now, I incorporate this one because I have worked with people in the past uh, you know, and it, it actually, here's a great example. I worked in a home that had a Jewish family that observed kosher rules. So I am Catholic. I am Christian. I am, uh, I eat what I want to, but I had respect for them and their house from a standpoint of, since it was a live-in position, one of the things I never brought into my section of the home was any type of pork product. And for those of you who know me know that I love bacon, but I would never bring that into their house. It is disrespectful. Also on high Jewish holidays, if I'm around the house or they're having an event, well, I'm going to put a kippah on. The kippah is the yarmulke, the small hat that uh, they wear in religious observance. Well, there are some out there who could say, well, I'm Catholic. That goes against all my teachings. Well, then, then so be it. Don't take a job. Be honest with yourself and don't take a job in an environment that you cannot adapt to. It is, it is nothing about religious preferences to me. It is purely showing respect for another person and their traditions. What about discretion? Well, discretion, as all of us know, is also one of the huge key components of our industry. Without discretion, we are nothing. Discretion, again, the definition is the quality of being discreet, especially with the reference 
to one's own actions or speech, prudence or decorum. If you are in the industry or if you've chosen this industry to be within proximity of fame or glamour or high money, well, I, you know, I really hope that you uh, choose exit stage right, right about now. Um, nothing, to be honest, nothing infuriates me more than a tell-all book or somebody who is uh, out to write such tell-all books. It is, it gives all of us a bad name. Now, the discretion is also just in your day-to-day -day life. When my wife and I are out having dinner somewhere, we always refer to Mr. and Mrs. by Mr. and Mrs. We never mention names. Why? Because you never know who is going to be at the table next to you. There was a, I had an incident with a family I worked for. I got a call from Mr. He asked me, Peter, where's Susie Q housekeeper? I said, oh, well, she's out at the grocery store picking up some groceries for the chef. She should be back in 20 minutes. Okay. Well, he told me, well, standing in line, uh, he, or he was in his office, received a call from a family member who just happened to be standing in the line next to the housekeeper and heard the housekeeper mention the family name. Well, this was an issue because it was a small community. The, everybody knew the family. So you never know who's overhearing you. I had to have the, employ the termination paperwork available for her when she returns because of a lack of discretion. Now, honesty, respect, discretion, it all feeds into your integrity. Integrity, integrity, integrity. Integrity is what drives our industry. Without it, you will not get far within our industry. You're, this is such a small industry that placement agencies here, um, there are a lot of uh, shady characters out there, same as the ones that like to do the uh, run to write the tell all books, tell all books. They just don't have a upright moral character. So they, it's, they, they drive me nuts. So I apologize if I get a little flustered with that. But integrity, it, you know, honesty and respect, it all has to do with misappropriation of funds or the simple act of including your family's meal on their credit card when you're buying the household uh, groceries. This is embezzlement. It's plain and simple. It is poor integrity. If you are using company funds to purchase or fund something of your own, it is embezzlement. It is a complete and total lack of integrity. And in, as I said before, in our industry, word spreads like wildfire and all of a sudden people understand. I mean, it's the adherence of moral and ethical principles, soundness of moral character, honesty, but most important of all, it is those traits when no one is looking. Again, it's constant. It is consistent. It is a part of your daily life. So let's move on. Let's talk about the relationship. Now the relationship is, is going to be your lifeline. Uh, while the world doesn't revolve around you, this slide does. And the reason of it is because you, as the household manager, as the state manager, as the nanny manager, as the housekeeper who runs the home, it is all about them, but it all centers around you because it is the services you deliver. So the uh, relationship between you and let's start with the principal. Well, this one's kind of a, a no-brainer. Obviously, if there's no relationship with you and the principal, there is no job. One of the things that I talk about on a regular basis is that chemistry is primary and your skills are secondary. I have been in the countless job interviews where I am the ideal candidate for the job. My skill sets and what I'm willing to do lines up directly with what they want to accomplish, but I don't feel the chemistry. 
or they don't feel the chemistry. They don't feel like they can talk to me or vice versa. I am, maybe I'm too intimidated by their personalities, which I will admit has happened. We're, we're human after all. So that relationship with your principal and you obviously is front and center and at the highest of the highest importance. Next is what we'd have is your staff. Now, this one is, this relationship is fairly straightforward. A happier work environment, a happier staff equals a higher production output. This is true. This is a fact of life. If you are, even with you in, in your job, if you are happier in your job, you're going to work harder. You're going to stay after when, when called upon. You're going to pick up the phone late at night if the, if the relationship is there. Same thing for the staff you manage. If you ha need some extra help in the evening time, well, guess what? That housekeeper who you've got a great relationship with, if they're available, they're going to stay. If they don't like the job all that much or they're just not – motivate employees, well, guess what's going to happen? They're not going to want to stay. It's just, you know, and all of a sudden you're in a bigger conundrum than you were before. So maintain that relationship, be happy with them, be joyful with them and know and let them feel appreciated because at the end of the day, they really should be. Your relationship with your vendors. This is another one that I've found huge value in. For one, you get a faster response time with vendors that like you versus don't like you. I have vendors that will show up at my door within 10, 30 minutes, basically how far they are away, because they know that I'm going to have a cup of coffee for them. I'm going to have a water. I'm not going to go straight in and say, oh, well, blah, you know, A, B, C, this is what we're doing. No, you you say hello, you ask them how their day's going, all of a sudden, you know, they've got a smile on their face, you take five minutes out of their time, and they're happier for it. You're going to get better, more honest service, you're going to get a service tech that's not going to try to charge you extra money um, for air filters, but it's not even needed, uh, or a belt for a fan that doesn't have a belt. I, you know, there's all these different aspects. Or what about just the education that stems from talking to the vendor after the work has been done? Or walking up and saying, hey, what is that? Why does that have to be this way? Or how did you know that this was happening or that this was the issue? These conversations, they make them feel human. They are human. They're just like you and me. They've chosen a different path in life. Most of the time, a very, very, very respectable path at that. Treat them like the humans they are. And I guarantee you, you will save money for your principal. You will become educated in whatever trade it is that they are working for, and you, which will lead to better skill set for yourself. Your fellow professional, the relationship with your fellow professional, I've, I've reached out to fellow professionals uh, on a regular basis when I'm fully involved with a client. If I don't have a vendor, I know that there are people that I can call to ask these questions and they will either have a solution for me or they will know somebody that I could call that they have a relationship with. So now all of a sudden, their relationship becomes my relationship and I now have an amazing vendor. That's what your fellow professionals are there for. Or just to listen to you when you're having a hard time and you're struggling with something. For that, I honestly recommend you give me a call, you shoot me a text, you drop me an email. If I have the time, I will spend it with you. I understand the frustrations of this job and uh, I hate people who are out there alone for it. So reach out, give me a call. You now have a new relationship with a fellow professional. Let's talk about the politics of our illustrious industry. Um, you know, every job, every work environment has politics. None of us like it very much, but if played properly, it will provide you with a, a much smoother sailing, as it, as it were. 
First and foremost is that the EAs and the PAs are the gatekeepers. Like it or not, they are. They can make your life miserable. They can make your job successful. It is up to you as to how you manage that. A uh, perfect example of that. I have two opposing views of that. First off, I had an executive assistant that didn't like me from day one and were constantly just trying to, you know, little sabotages here and there. And I've got uh, some verbiage from an email that she sent accidentally to me, but also to the mister saying, FYI, I think this is just another excuse from Peter for not paying the bills on time. How did he know these bills were in the stack? And if he knew, why didn't he tell the Susie Q assistant that he needed them to be paid? Well, there's a lot more that goes beyond this, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you the full story, but you can see the wording of the email. You can see how it was set up as a negative, uh, negative connotation which did lead to the end of that job. If there is no harmony there, then I can't get any done. On the flip side of that, I had the, my most recent position, um, a shout out to a wonderful lady by, by the name of Karen Hosack, who was a beacon of support and resolution in my last job. If I needed the time from Mr., I would have to send one text to her and within five minutes, I'd be getting a phone call from Mr. If I needed to schedule time face to face, I always had that time face to face. It is, it is hugely invaluable. Um, that is, I mean, again, the EA or the PA is going to, if you don't have direct regular contact with them, this is going to be your methods of contact. One will destroy you. One will make you. They also, you think they're the ones sitting in the employer's ears all day long. So do you don't think that they're, what they say is going to matter? It's just like a little bug in the ear. It's there. Next point is that it may be tempting, but never cross that professional line. Now, uh, Charles McPherson has a great way of putting it, and he calls it the magic line. And if you envision yourself and your principal on the left and on the right, and in the middle, just draw a solid line down the uh, down between you two. Now, take the opposite end of the pencil and erase it. Still going to leave a faint line behind. Now, that's what you're truly dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a very faint line, and the line moves regularly. It all depends on what their mood is, your mood is. So this line is blurred and it moves, but never, ever, ever cross it. Once you cross it is when it takes way more work to go back. Uh, another story of my failures, uh, my lesson of, uh, of crossing that professional line. It was end of a long day, something like 14 hours. We're just wrapping up a party for the family I was working for, and I was running around. I was the only one there, and I was pulling cars around for the family. Well, a couple of the kids, the young ones, the teenagers, walk out, uh, and they're laughing and joking. And One of them looks over at me and says, wow, Peter, you really do everything. Well, I was exhausted. I wasn't ha didn't have my right mind. And I said, yeah. <laughs> I love this job. I am just the all around B-I-T-C-H. I do everything. And I started laughing and I said, just kidding, blah, blah, blah. But it was too late. The words already crossed my, my lips. Not 12 hours later did I get a call from Mr. to meet him in his office where we talked about it. So, you know, again, this is, uh, uh, it's embarrassing, but never cross that professional boundary. Getting back over there is incredibly difficult. Another thing that you're going to be exposed to is family fights. And there's really only three ways to handle the family fight. One, excuse yourself. Get out of there. I use the excuse of, oh, sorry, I left something on the printer I needed. Let me go grab that real quick. And I sit there and I wait till that fight's over. I come back. 
I get asked, well, oh, did you grab that doc? Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't get the printer to work. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll deal with that later. Oh, you know, Peter, I'm really sorry that you had to witness that. It's no problem. This is, it's just, these are just family being family. So we were talking about this. Uh, this we were talking about this budget item before uh, we got interrupted. So basically, I never take sides and it, I act like it never happened. So remove yourself from the situation. Never take sides, no matter how tempting it is, because I promise you it will bite you in the rumpus if you do. There are trust issues and complicated uh, complications that come to play, especially if it is on the decline of, uh, of a marriage and a divorce does happen. You don't want to be viewed as somebody taking sides. Bickering staff and gossip is something that you are going to also have to deal with. My, I always suggest is nip it in the bud right away. The bickering staff, um, that is just personalities that are at conflict of working with each other. It's, it's a reality. It is, it's not a terrible thing. It's just, it, it is what it is. So we have to become almost conflict resolution people. And it's not something that you can just skirt over. You need to address it. You need to address both employees' concerns and come up with a resolution and follow up with that resolution and make sure that both of those bickering employees are adhering to your solution. Now, if one is not, one is and one isn't, well, then, you know, you do have to take it further and eventually, hopefully not, but it may end up in termination. But bickering staff is not, is nothing that you can, it's a, it's a sign of a bigger issue. Um, gossip, of course, you know, that we just nip in the bud. That is something I don't barrel in and, and become very adamant about correcting it. I join in, I figure out what it is that they're talking about, and then I turn the tables. I start talking about these things in a very positive light, uh, letting, helping them understand maybe where certain viewpoints come from. So if we can educate, then we can stop and it'll never happen again. If we go in there as a manager and say, this will never happen again, uh, you know, enough, done, anybody else does it, you're fired. Well, one, let's go back to what we were talking about in the previous slides in the relationship. You're building the relationship. You want the employees to know that you truly care about them. You will get more work out of them. You'll have a higher, you'll have a more harmonious environment, which amazingly enough, the ladies of the house can always, always feel if the home has a positive or negative energy on it. The last part is, of course, the public opinion of your employers. If you are working with someone that is high profile, then this may come to pass. Just uh, the key to remember here is that it is not your job to correct public opinion of your employer. If you hear it, ignore it and move on. Again, this goes back to what we were talking about, about discretion. You're not being discreet if you're trying to correct public opinion. If, they, if somebody knows I work for a family and they have an opinion of it, my standard answer is Mr. and Mrs. Smith are wonderful people to work for. I am so fortunate to be able to get to spend time with them every day and to get paid for it. Can you imagine that? How wonderful. I get the best job in the world. Oh, well, they do this and this. Oh, but you know, that's that, that is their public persona. I work for them on a private level. Oh, well, can you tell? No, I'm sorry. I can't tell you anything more. I am bound by a non-disclosure agreement. That one usually gets people to shut up right away and they don't ask another question. So you're fail safe. I am sorry, but I am bound by non-disclosure agreement. I cannot talk about anything that pertains to them. All right. This will be our second to last slide, last informative slide, but it is something that I think is, is important, and that is personal appearance. You need to be, you need to dress like it is the first day every day. 
wear proper attire at all times. There have been studies that have shown how this affects the, uh, how it affects your day in and day out attitude. It is, you know, throughout history, people have judged and been judged on the basis of their looks and appearances. You know, simply because someone looks and dresses a certain way, people assume that's who they are. People are often incorrectly judged by their appearance and actions. I'm not here to justify it. I'm not here to say whether it's good or bad. I am just saying that the reality is that it happens. So be mindful of uh, be mindful of how you're dressing and how you are representing your employer. Because remember, you're representing your employer at the grocery store just as much as you would be in the home of who it is that you're working for. You don't know who you're going to run into. If I run into a vendor and I look like a schlub, well, at uh, so most of the time they understand, but if it's a family friend or you just don't know, especially in some of these smaller communities. Your hair obviously needs to be properly groomed at all times. This is, you know, get a haircut. Sorry, you hippie. Joking. It is, you know, you're, you should be properly groomed. Your hair should be properly groomed. Your facial hair, you know, I think facial hair is okay. I can't say much. I have a mustache. But the reason I have a mustache and not a beard is that's because that's all I can grow. But if I had a beard, it would be neatly trimmed. It would, it would look presentable. I'm not going to grow it out. I'm not, I don't want to look like a woolly booger, but it will be neatly trimmed and presentable. Ladies, if you have, uh, if you wear makeup, you have nails, your makeup should really only be used minimally. I don't, I can't speak honestly on makeup, obviously. Um, I am a guy, I, I have no, the only exposure I have of it is uh, watching my beautiful wife get ready for uh, work every morning. But we don't want to be looked, looked at like a made up clown. Again, we are to be of service. We're not meant to stand out. Um, Charles McPherson says another thing is that a, um, a butler should be interested, but not interesting. Meaning, bright makeup, flashy nails. You're drawing attention away from your principal where you where it should be. Now, if you do have nails and nails do pop off, find that nail. Nothing, nothing creeps me out more than finding nails here and there. And if they do find it, of course, now they're looking at a cleanliness issue, and we're talking about a whole different set of circumstances. Uh, another one is no perfumes or colognes. And this is a big one. There are, you know, most of us have heard about the stories that have uh, been done that are related to our olfactory system. Think of your favorite smell. Now, this favorite smell, the, it most likely creates some, it invokes a memory, it invokes a feeling. Uh, the first smell of freshly fallen snow, um, clean sheets. There are, you know, even the, the perfume that my wife wears, the, they, cre they create a stirring, they cause emotion. Now, you don't want to be in someone's house and be inserting yourself into their house. So, no colognes or perfumes. I'm sorry, but think of if you having this wonderful thought about, and you're having a memory based on a smell and then all of a sudden somebody walks by and smells like they bathed in perfume. Well, that is exactly what you're doing to your principles by wearing perfume or colognes to work. You are leaving yourself behind. Um, actually, David Barry's got a really good point of uh, keeping an additional set of clothes at work. Uh, I do the same thing. I leave a, a t-shirt and a pair of slacks because most of the day, day in and day out, if I'm working, I am in a nice pair of jeans, 
a button-up shirt and a blazer. Why do I wear jeans? Because there are times where I am in the attic or I'm in a crawl space and I don't feel like uh, wasting a pair of khakis on something like that. They rip too easy. They're just not, uh, not always the easiest to work in. But if you keep a, an additional set at work, if I get a stain on my shirt, all I have to do is pop it off, pop the new one back on, and I still look presentable for when the guests do arrive in the afternoon or the unexpected guests. So if, find a space and, and keep a set of extra clothes there for you. You know, the last point I have is get a book on body language. Now, this is one thing that I have, I've, I've gotten, I've gotten before and have been really surprised at how well, how much it impacts me and, and my ability to speak with the principles. I know I'm going to post a, a link here to the, uh, to the uh, body language book that I've used. Again, I'm not trying to become a professional body language reader. I just want to know when Mr. and Mrs. are done talking to me. If we're in a meeting and we're going over topics and all of a sudden they start looking around or their body language changes or maybe they pick up their phone, I know it's time to end that conversation because any answers I get from here are not going to be of any help to me. They're going to forget it because they're distracted. I can also get a feeling when a, when a vendor is being dishonest. Um, or if he is looking to rush through a project, interviewing someone, I can tell if they're uncomfortable. If, they're, if they start fidgeting, they start becoming uncomfortable, well, then there's something, there's something there I need to address even more. So, you know, and also just be aware. Like right now, you can't see me, but I have a, you know, I, I, nervously uh, with my, I'm nervous actions with my hands. So I talk with my hands a lot. I may, I may pinch my fingers or, or pick at them a little bit and it's a nervous habit. If you don't know what you're looking for, well, then it's, it's no big deal. But if you understand body language, now you know I'm nervous. Now you know I'm, you know, which is understandable, I hope. But these are all things that will help you identify how to guide a conversation or when to end a conversation. All right, for today, that's all I had to scheduled to, to cover. I didn't want to take up too much of your time. I do want to say, don't forget to turn into the, uh, to tune in to the next edition, which is on Thursday at one o'clock as well. I am really looking forward to uh, doing more of these. The vid this video will be posted on our Facebook page, and I will share again some of the links. I'll share a link to the body language. I'll share a book. I'll share a link to an article uh, that I found that has to do with um, the, uh, what was it? Pardon me. Let me just check my notes here. There's another link I have that I really want to share with you. I'm drawing a blank as to what it is, but it will be there and pertaining to some of the things that we discussed. Uh, if you have any questions, you can see my information is right there. Solutions at vanrider.com. That is my personal cell phone number. So if you have something that uh, you need an immediate answer for, or you just want to say hi, that's where you reach out to me. Um, if you have, uh, if you're liking what you hear and you want to go deeper, I do recommend coming to our um, essentials class, which is coming up at the end of this month. Uh, we'll post a link here that will take you to it. Um, it is, it's really great. It's a two day course. And at the end of the course, we go not only into this, but we also go into how to write an estate manual. And you will be able, you will have all the tools, the templates, and everything you need to walk away and write a fully fledged estate manual. I will even have one there that is based off of all these templates for you to take a look at. Again, thank you so much for tuning in today. It means, uh, it means the world to me to see everybody out there um, paying attention, listening, and absorbing. 
And I hope to see you all again on uh, Thursday, same time, same bat channel. So Thursday, 1 o'clock, where we'll go over our next set. I hope to see everybody. And don't forget to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Y'all have a wonderful, wonderful day.